So I wanted to open this before we introduce ourselves with a quote from one of my favorite essays of all time. Um, the optimal user is someone who does not want the burden of choice or feels they do not have the time to make their own decisions. It is for this person that the modern web is designed, and it is this type of person the modern web encourages all of us to be. So this is from Zach. Mandeville's um, essay, The Future Will Be Technical. It's at coolguy.website. It's a really excellent piece of writing about sort of our relationship to modern technology and um, the way we exist online and the ways that it damages us. <laughs> so starting from there, sorry, I'm going to pull up my notes again. Um, I'm going to have our panelists introduce themselves in a second, but um, just to kind of set the stage for our topic here, um, in the modern web and what we think of as Web 2, everything has kind of these guardrails on it, right? Everything is simplified, our paths are clear, you have only so many options, and this makes things easier, but it's also really disempowering. Um, so. I think that we all in this room probably agree that things like can and should be different. Um, but what that means is still a little bit fuzzy, right? Like it's still left to be defined. And there's even an argument to be made, I think, that it shouldn't be defined so much as discovered, like in cooperation with the people that we're designing for. So with that, I'm going to invite the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, let us know, less interested in affiliation and more in sort of what you do, what your background is, um, and the kinds of people that you design for, who you think of as your users. Awesome. Hello. I am Scott. Uh, I co-founded Gitcoin back in 2017, I think. I'm trying to remember. It seems like a while ago now. Um, I think for me, you know, I, I actually don't uh, come from, which is, I'm, I'm the outlier on this panel, like a design background, but I do a lot of community design and think about the role of the community in participatory decision making, both in the context of the data that we, we run, but also in the process of, um, you know, things like quadratic funding, which are more about um, local first sort of community led decisions for funding. And I think, um, you know, the, the quote that you mentioned is actually like, very resonant to me because the experience definitely I had growing up on the web, I think reflects that. Um, and certainly was, I think like a, you know, I was at this era, I grew up in this era where I think it was just on the precipice of things like Facebook and all these big platforms, which I think I don't need to dive into the details on, like that we all know kind of have created this uh, tension. Um, and I sort of saw that magic of the internet uh, disappear a little bit. And so I'm very hopeful that with the tools we're building here, we think about bringing that magic back and like kind of think about you know the, the weirdness of the internet as it used to be as something that we can actually like use in an empowering way within our own communities. Um, so that's just what came to mind, but I'll, I'll leave it there. That's perfect. Take over. Um, so guys, I'm Hester. Um, I work as an independent UX researcher. Uh, I have a background in psychology and interaction design. Um, and yeah, kind of do what is necessary at any given time. So I, I yeah, I don't yeah, like sticking to a particular function or role too much. Um, my kind of views, I think, have been mostly influenced by my last five years or so uh, at Status. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, it's one of the, uh, I'd say, one of the, the older older projects uh, in this space, but also an incredibly principled one on bringing privacy and security um, and participation uh, to everyone by putting um, access to Ethereum onto a mobile phone, uh, among other things. Um, so that's kind of like what has, uh, in a way, re-educated me, <laughs> um, or educated me in the first place about uh, uh, kind of the, the ignorance I had around like privacy and data I'd be giving up and um, kind of the, the 
trade-off that I was making for convenience. Um, for context, I also spent a very short stint at um, the ads department of what is now Meta. Um, and so I, I have a bit of a nuanced view on kind of the big bad wolf of um, social media companies uh, as well, uh, seeing problems as very systematic. Um, so that's, that's another lens I, I try to look at things from. So um, I guess that's me, uh, Rachel. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name's Rachel. I'm on, uh, I work at the Ethereum Foundation on the Privacy and Scaling Explorations team with Althea. <laughs> um, my background is in fine arts. I went to school for sculpture and I was doing a lot of work related to, um, you know, how do people interact with um, objects and spaces and how can those interactions uh, create conversation and communication. And um, it was also, I think, a time where I was exploring a lot of, like, how can you um, find metaphor to explain things in new ways? And that's what I relate to the work I do on the PSE team. Uh, we're working with um, developers who are creating zero-knowledge protocols and apps. The, Content is really abstract and complex, so um, a lot of my role is like spending time with developers or in conversations with Althea and um, other designers, other communicators, and saying like, how can we um, find ways to make this understandable or familiar uh, so that more people can be involved in conversations around uh, designing for ZK? Um, and the users that we're focused on right now are a lot of other app uh, developers and designers who want to be making their own products with uh, the zero knowledge protocols that our team is creating. Thank you, and I will also introduce myself, but I wanted to lead with you guys. Um, so my name is Althea, as Rachel said, I also work on the privacy and scaling explorations team at the EF, um, but I lead communications there. Um, I actually also have a fine arts background, but as a fine arts major, I really gravitated toward what most people would call crafts. Um, so I was a ceramicist, I was really a potter because I, I just could never really enjoy or get my head around the idea of creating things for people to just consume. I wanted to create things that people would like use and have as a part of their lives and eventually destroy probably or give away or whatever that things that are not sort of there for money or to like you know accumulate value or to just be pretty to look at but things that really are part of your life that you kind of build experiences around um so rachel's kind of explained what pse's like user base is but um in terms of communicating with that user base, I have a similar kind of approach of wanting to put out things that people, um, we don't just want to market ourselves, right? We like, that's not even a little bit what we do, <laughs> um, but we want to educate people and like invite people to be a part of this, to create stuff with us, to give us feedback, to help us iterate um, and to like just themselves become builders of the worlds that they want to live in. Um, so this panel is ostensibly about user experience, but I think it has to start with kind of redefining what a user even is and maybe just throwing out the word user entirely because it's kind of sucks for the way that we want to think about the people that are interacting with the things that we create, right? Like user implies this very passive thing. Um, we make you use, it's this sort of client server model of like human interaction. And we expect as users to have our platform sort of consume and parse and spit back out little packaged things that we can like then process in this very simple and very sort of deadening way. I'm a little bit biased on all of this, obviously. Um, <laughs> but to think about um, users in a different way as being sort of more human having like uh, you know, entire lives, minds, responsibilities, um, like capabilities, um, 
really requires a huge mental shift. It, it means thinking in a very different way about sort of who's on the other end of whatever it is that you're working on. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys, like, you've all come from more kind of traditional backgrounds, right? You didn't all start in Web3, um, which is a term I hope to never use again in this conversation. And I'm sorry, I hate it. Um, <laughs> because it defines itself against the thing that it's trying not to be, right? And we want Web3 to be something a lot better than like Web2 with a blockchain on it. Like those foundations are just broken. We don't want to build on them. We want to rebuild them. So um, coming from the backgrounds that you did, what have been some of the challenges or like the things that you've had to really unlearn or rethink or reimagine as you've been coming into this new space and like coming with this new approach? I think for me, the biggest learning has probably been that so I, I before I even did anything in in I'll say crypto I love three like the um, my work was actually in more machine learning which is very like much removed from the person because I mean you have sort of this notion in machine learning of like working with people but only in the sense that like people at some point made like training data that, that you're you're then kind of applying like at a much later point so like people in the past like often like the far past did something now you're kind of drawing on that. <laughs> I think with something like quadratic funding and what we're doing with Gitcoin, it's much more about like kind of even the word the, the word agent isn't great, but like I'll, I'll use agent as compared to like algorithm. And I think um, you know what we're trying to do is like have people form kind of collective intelligence like you know at a given point in time where they're actually present and they're actually participating and they're actually um, making a decision you know for, for now for the future um, versus kind of using this previous past uh, like training data. And I think that's, you know, one shift that's been really interesting for me to explore. And I think it's been kind of exciting to see that like web, you know, crypto uh, tends to be a lot more about like the idea of people being participants in a system, um, even when, um, you know, they're, they're just kind of providing signal or providing some kind of like aggregate information. Um, but I think there's something deeper to that, which is just like, um, Simona Pop talks about this a lot too, also in the Gitcoin community. Uh, the idea of like kind of human thriving or like bringing your like whole self to something that you're doing. I think there's definitely even beyond just like, I think the user experience kind of concept is a, is a symptom of a broader way of framing like the interaction we have with like, institutions or organizations in which we sort of talk about like, oh, like I guess we're sort of like a customer or we're like, um, you know, one, we have one facet of ourselves in the, in the conversation. But I think it's actually much more important for us to think about, like, how do we start to bring more of ourselves to the institutions that we're building? And then how do the institutions change as a result of that? So I, I'm kind of partly thinking of this in the context of, like, this shift from algorithm to, to agent, which isn't entirely correct, but is, is one thing I'm interested in. And then I'm also thinking of it in terms of, like, kind of bringing, like, one part of the elephant and that sort of, like, blind man and the elephant analogy uh, to, like, actually trying to look at the whole elephant and look at the whole picture um, of each person that's in the community to better kind of serve them in in the institution. Thanks for mentioning the word future, because that was <laughs> my cue to my notes. I was like, oh yes, future, that's what I wanted to say. Um, now I always have this, um, because we were talking about like users, what defines users, and in, in um, UX and design, like this is like, always eternal ongoing debate, right? Users versus human-centered versus um, like the creators. Uh, there's a lot of different labels that you can give and a lot of different views on it. Um, yeah, I, I, I have my own, but um, I think my most uh, critical insight relates more to how we define UX, which like traditionally uh, coming from a psychology, cognitive psychology background was always focused on uh, the usability side, like how efficient can we get people through flows? Are we providing the right information? Uh, but it was never focused around the future context. Um, and to me, that's uh, that's been pretty eye-opening um, to the extent that I actually looked looked up the official 
kind of ISO definition of UX, <laughs> which actually does include like context and uh, long-term impact of what your experience is when you're using something. Um, and yeah, to me, it's been most um, yeah most interesting to see how the systems that we're building um, require us to think beyond these basic flows to talk in design language uh, to what is it going to de come to do for people in the future, uh, be it the like the initial users or indirectly their their context, their environment. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but <laughs> Rachel. Oh, right, no, there was one thing I wanted to say. I it occurred to me just now how interesting it is that we are sitting here talking about participation design and like reminder, open chair. <laughs> you really just wanted the water, didn't you? <laughs> we have to share a mic if somebody comes up. That's okay. Uh, hey guys, I'm Dimo from the Empire Wallet. And actually, uh, one of the <clears throat> I've been uh, with my team. We have some people here. We've been building uh, building products since uh, 2013, and we got into Web3 in 2017, probably. And uh, one of the huge issues that we always had with products is uh, user experience, right? And uh, the thing that we have with uh, Web3 right now is that it's very hard to get those Web2 people into Web3. So what do you use? You use the, the tools that we have already, like email and password, right? And we're trying to, to, like, to make it really, uh, really secure to get those people in a secure, uh, in a secure and uh, known for them uh, manner to get into our products. So, <clears throat> I'm a little bit nervous, I'm sorry. So, uh, we, have we have created a model where you can create an account with username and password. And uh, we are smart wallets, which means we are built on top of smart, con smart contracts. And we're able to, to get the private keys and put them on the browser and put it on the back end. So we have like uh, two different private keys. And this way we're able to, uh, to get something they already know and to put it in our product. We don't want to change, like we're not able to come with something like very different. It, it doesn't make any sense to come with something very different and uh, educate people how to use it. We're using things that they already know. And the other point is that uh, basically uh, Web3 and uh, blockchain is not, uh, uh, it's complex. And one of the things that we've been uh, working on is explaining transactions in a human-friendly way. So you're signing something and we're explaining you exactly what you're signing. So there is no bothering, right? And uh, basically this is the, the two keys of uh, our product. Of course, we have very smart people and uh, they've been working on very interesting things. And the wallet itself uh, works with abstractions when we're taking advantage of all those beautiful things that we have on the smart contracts in general. But uh, yeah, this, this is why I actually attended this uh, talk because that's, that's the most important part, like to get the Web3, Web3 users and bring it on Web3. That's, that's the whole thing in here. So uh, we have created a product that my mom can use easily. So she has an email, right? And uh, our, uh, our point here is to, to create it secure, like to, to create an account securely into Web3. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. So, do, go ahead. Well, do you see, like, so, like, I mean, you're talking about, like, kind of privacy, security, like, and I think that, like, ties in to actually your work, like, Rachel, like, pretty deeply. Like, how do you think about, like, explaining that stuff to users? Like, that just seems very difficult, <laughs> especially with ZK, especially. That's, like even on its own complicated. But if you want to respond to that first. Um, so when I joined the team, that's where my head was. Like, wow, this stuff is so <laughs> weird. How do I explain it to my parents? Um, how, can I, how can we make these apps that um, my friends and family can use? And I was very stuck in that like headspace. And it took me like, a little while before I realized that that was like a misdirection for us and our team specifically because we're making public goods 
what we want to do is we want to make um, protocols that other people can build with. We want to create proof of concept applications that people can use that inspire them to build and to make. So I really liked also the, and thank you for being the first to join us, by the way. You're very brave. I'm not kicking you out. But if anybody else does want to come up, you know, that wasn't so bad, right? Um, yeah, come on. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I wanted to um, just like come back to a point that you made about um, using kind of. You want to come back? Well, now we've got another volunteer. <laughs> um, the more the better, right? Um, but about using kind of human readable language to describe these kind of complex processes. This is, this is something that Rachel talked about in her presentation yesterday. Also, um, that yes, the stuff that's going on is complicated, but a lot of the times where you lose people is actually just in literally the language that you use to describe it. That people are not stupid and they're not like incapable, but they don't know what a zero knowledge proof is. They don't know what a polynomial is, whatever it is that like, putting that stuff into just more common language can go a long way. And it's something that I think we kind of forget that people do like to understand things. People like to explore, people are curious. Um, so like to kind of empower people by helping them to understand what's going on and helping them to see the tools that are actually in front of them. Um, so I think that that was a really like a powerful point. So thanks for that. And do you wanna? Yeah, uh, just a uh, Oh, are we on? Or, sorry, Scott, did you have something to Ooh, Okay, yeah, so just to build on what you were saying about complexity. So, well, hi, I'm Nelly, uh, head of adoption at IXEC, one of the oldest projects in, uh, in France. And well, uh, I want to share my experience um, because I'm, I love uh, mass adoption and inclusion and diversity in the space. And when I joined this project, this project was launched by researchers we're doing blockchain uh, confidential computing. And one of our first audiences was people looking for computing powers, data sets, applications. And it's a very technical, um, technical audience. And then my job is kind to um, bring like our technology to masses. But when you're doing it with oracles, confidential computing, you know, it's not as easy. So we came up with this thing. Uh, it's, it's a new product. And uh, it's about using confidential computing to protect our uh, personal data. So th the idea behind this is like, hey, our protocol is complex and how can we make people identify with our product, with our features? So trying to sell <laughs> oracles and you know, uh, trusted execu uh, execution environments is hard, but we realized that the thing that was linking us to uh, the audience is like nobody identifies with computing power to oracles is really hard, but we all have an identity. We all have personal data. And what we're trying to do is like create, you create an avatar and then you put all your um, personal data, email address, age, uh, everything. You transform it using confidential computing, using confidential L NFTs. And this is this, the way that now you're going to connect and access products and services in Web3. And then everybody can uh, can identify it with hologram. Hologram is me. It's my personal data. I transform it and then I connect. So one of the uh, things I learned, like try to find that feature, that narrative that really connects you uh, with your audience, even if your project or your protocol is complex. Yeah, I think that's really important, like finding something that people can connect to or like see themselves in or that, like Rachel said, again, in your, your presentation was just really good. I'm going to like reference it probably a few times, um, <laughs> but something that feels familiar, like, you know, something that um, is like something that you know. Um, did you have something you wanted to add there, Scott? Well, just that one common theme, I think, and it probably will come up like as other people come up as well, which I'll like say any, anyone else wants to come up should. Um, I think it's really actually interesting to think about like education because we don't really like we don't actually educate users in a lot of we, we kind of do it implicitly in existing design paradigms where we're just kind of like, here's the flow and like then you walk through and by definition, you've now understood what you're supposed to do. There's a lot of like pre-work that's I think required with like a lot of these products that like we're sort of touching on. And like, I think there's the option of trying to reduce that. There's the option of trying to like have people better identify with that. 
And so like just going back to like your your like sort of first question, like how are we redefining what a user is, like the part of participation is like being involved in kind of learning and growing and like educating. And that's actually something that people I think are like often uh, in the context of like using a product or being part of a community, like sometimes uncomfortable with. Um, but it's really important to be able to do that. So Yeah, definitely. So and that kind of leads me to and I hope that this one will also be interesting for you. Welcome. Um, uh, like another thing that I wanted to bring up, um, and I think education is like a big piece of this, but it's also much deeper, um, how you inspire people to like to take responsibility for the, the actions that they take, um, responsibility for um, you know giving the feedback that helps to shape a platform, just responsibility for kind of curating the spaces that we create together. Um, what are some of the other things that we think about um, when we're trying to like give that power to people and like inspire and expect them to make that contribution back? Uh, I, I can give you a quick <laughs> response to that. No, I've, I was thinking along um, the lines of the, the first two um, people that joined us up here um, that we were talking about language, right? And how do you um, use language to uh, help people under understand what's going on. And if we want to talk about participation design, um, that's, that to me is where the pivot is what, between users and participants. You need to know like, what's going on. You need transparency on the system um, in order to participate. Um, so yeah, just like my line of thinking of uh, the distinction between designing for users, designing for participants, we need a lot more system transparency, which also means we need to understand how these things work. Uh, and especially designers need to understand how to bring it then to the surface and communicate it. Um, but I'm very curious how that, <laughs> or you were going to bring up. So I, my name is Germany, like the country. Um, <laughs> So I'm co-founder of a hyper-local DAO in Tampa, Florida called Tampa Bay DAO, TBD for short, because we're always figuring shit out. <laughs> but yeah, so one thing we really like to do is like help out the local community and like kind of comes back down to education and onboarding. Because in Tampa, we have a diverse group of people, old, young. And one thing that kept coming up for us was before we started getting to like ZK rollups or different like networks in the uh, crypto ecosystem and Web3, I realized as we were like doing these like really like um, educational like classes is we kept missing the initial principles in which that governs crypto. And so what I did was I created this um, visual web and it has starting in the middle, which is the part that uh, people forget is self-sovereignty. So people ask me, well, why are you here? And I'm like, well, if you read the Bitcoin white paper, like, what does it really mean? So that's in the middle. And then it kind of breaks out into the trifecta and it goes into like trustlessness, consensus, proof of work, proof of stake. Ethereum, so then people start to understand like a ravel of, oh, now I understand the greater whole. Now I see why we need ZK rollups to get for that. And I think that really helps in terms of what you were saying as well, which is like education is key, but education forms of like the principles versus really getting into like the bite code of like, well, here's how we got to do this. You got to chart it. Like, no, we don't. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's all I just like wanted to say with that. And I thought it was interesting because education really is important for that. I really want to see that. Um, visual. So, so what I actually think I like posted this like open source, you know, what can just download and use it for to teach people in your local neighborhoods or communities. So yeah. Awesome. And sorry, what was it called? Oh, uh, I have to like post it up. It? It's like on like Kumo. Uh, I'll like share out whoever wants to connect after this and give you the link. So cool. yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, Rachel, did you have anything you wanted to add there? Well. Um, yeah, I guess it's just so interesting to think about like we all, everyone who's talking right now is designing for different audience members, um, but we're all thinking about education on different levels. So um, I just, I get stuck on this idea that I hear people, you know, say like, well, this has to be usable. Like this stuff is not approachable yet. And for me, it's like, that's okay. That's where we are right now. But like, if we don't spend time like really educating ourselves, like the people who are making it and documenting our process and documenting our learnings, then like we're not going to get to that like end point that everyone's visualizing where like everything is really easy for anyone to use. Um, so uh, like 
Germany was saying about like creating these visual maps, um, creating these resources for people from different learning levels to onboard into the space. I think that's just really important. I really like that. And I think this is something that we forget a lot that like we are also users and participants in this, like all of these things were sort of the first participants. We are hopefully building in the way that we hope other people will continue to build. Um, and so to kind of build for ourselves, I think is not selfish, it's practice. It's like, that's the first iteration and we learn what that learning process is like by having to model through it as we go. Um, so yeah, I think to, to sort of just, um, as Rachel was saying, like document those processes and really pay attention to what it's like for us to learn and for us to find that inspiration is really, important and, and like really valuable. And we have a new friend. Yeah, um, super grateful to be here in the presence of everyone. Um, my name's Sean. Um, I'm working on a community owned and operated proactive healthcare system. Um, so it's a DAO um, and this seemed super aligned because um, in healthcare, we think a lot about how we can co-create health experiences for people, especially people combating stuff like chronic diseases, have to have some sort of lifestyle change and it's quite interesting the parallels between Web3, where we have to basically design for a participatory experience. Because if the people involved in the experience are not playing an active part in designing what they want to do, and in a sense, autonomy, um, in healthcare, that helps people stick to whatever they're committing to do. Um, and in Web3, I think what we want to design and what we want is to let people come into our product or our community. Uh, and then figure out how they intentionally, with their own values, missions, fit in the community. And we spend a lot of time like figuring out how that looks like for a healthcare DAO. Um, and I'm curious to hear what your guys' thoughts are on that kind of int intentionality in community onboarding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do you want? <laughs> I'll I'll just quickly say I think. Thank there's you. definitely, thank you, yeah, there's there's a huge challenge with anything to do with community, which is, you know, what, what is the what is the boundary of, of community? Like, what is the community? What is the goal of the community? What's the purpose? Why are people there? You know, what what is their, like, kind of, um, how did it start? What were the principles behind that? I think um, one of the challenges is always, I think actually it's easier in some ways with a defined mission like you're talking about to rally people around something that in this case if if it's a you know group of people that all have sort of like some amount of like chronic illness like I think there's a shared sort of kernel of of um, similarity and like a feeling of kind of congeniality between people by definition um, whereas you know with something like crypto I think like maybe just not to go too off track we mean many different things by it like lots of people in this room probably mean different things by it. And so figuring out like what those uh, like kernels are, what those like core uh, like principles are, like like Germany said, I think is like really important um, as we think about like you know not necessarily even like I think boundaries maybe the wrong word, but like what is the sort of like um, inclusion criteria in the community, and and that's important because you need to make sure that um, you know if someone is participating that they're doing to to your point like they're taking the responsibility, doing the relevant work. So it's a little bit of a tangent, like that's not directly answering the question, but like. I think that's a really important, like, just discovery process for any new community. Yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 this is a conversation, right? So <laughs> I don't think you missed any question. Um, no, thank you, Sean. Where's Sean? Sean left. No. You're back there. <laughs> no, it gave me. Um, uh, it added a dot for me in like the the framework of going from like user to participation, which is ownership. Uh, that's in between and getting this sense of ownership. Um, where, and I don't know too much about like the, the healthcare industry and how that's like, like transitioning into um, letter-based um, <laughs> applications. Not sure what else to uh, call it. Call um, it whatever. We whatever. Want. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> um, yeah, healthcare seems like a, a, an interesting case because that's where ownership um, ties to like this very um, intrinsic. You need ownership over your own body. Like it makes it very tangible. Um, and if we want to expand ownership to communities, you first need that sense of ownership over the community um, that you are impacted by 
decisions that are made the same as you're impacted by decisions that doctors would make over your own health care. Um, so it, yeah, just added that question in my mind at least on how do you first create ownership over the community before you um, ask or try and incentivize people to participate in it. Um, yeah, starting to draw a framework here. Yeah. Awesome. And I think I just want to add a quick point that um, with designing ZK stuff, um, I feel strongly that I don't want people to feel polarized from being participants in creating the like products that use zero knowledge. Like it sounds <laughs> sciencey or mathy, and um, I think we have this like obligation to make it approachable so that people like people know what they want. Why do we have to? only follow former models of saying like we'll figure out what they need and design for them when we could try something different where people can like co-create the experiences that they want. Hi, um, my name is Manu and I'm one of the founders of Doing Good, also founding member of API 3 DAO and a couple of other DAOs um, that I participate. Um, I really like the conversation. However, I have a couple of things um, that is bothering me uh, quite a lot. Let's hear it. Um, yeah, most of us are here building tools, as you said, for ourselves. Um, but most of the people that are building the space are actually from very privileged countries. Um, and yeah, basically those tools that are being built are not being built for the people that actually need it. Um, and that bothers me a lot. Uh, also, another thing that bothers me is that we're cre we are using a lot of terms or we're creating these new terms like, um, let's say, stable coins, which are not really stable. We know that they're not stable or we call them uh, soul bound tokens. What the fuck is that? You know, <laughs> um, and yeah, it's it's just very confusing for people that are outside of the space. Um, it's not really inclusive when we are creating these new terms that cannot even be translated. When we talk about staking, I don't even know how to say that in Spanish. Um, I don't even, I need to explain it all the time to people. So I, I think that we are uh, getting to a trap um, when we are creating all of these new terms and so on. Um, we're trying to onboard people and we're trying to onboard masses as we say, but in reality, we're just onboarding other gigs. Um, and yeah, it's to me, it's it's really bad. And we say that also we're creating a more decentralized space, more inclusive space. When reality is just a bunch of white people just doing that, just talking between them. Um, so you know, are we really doing what we're saying that we're doing? Um, are we really using the language and the tools that we have for inviting new people to join us, or are we just you know trying to? Be cool. Thank you <laughs> for, okay. Um, really, thank you for like bringing up some really challenging and like really important points. Um, and there were a couple of different things there that I don't know, maybe we can get to all of them. Uh, but maybe let's start with the first one, which was, um, yeah, that we tend to be sort of insular, like we're sort of designing for the people that we see. And um, this community is, you know, we, we would like to think that it's global, but it's really difficult to figure out how to reach people. And we end up designing in ways that like make sense in my brain, but uh, in a place that I've never been, in a culture that I've never experienced, in a language that I don't speak, uh, it can be really difficult to predict, which also comes back to kind of what Rachel was saying that um, there's a difference between trying to figure out what people want and then make it and then like this sort of hopefully interactive process of inviting people in to like figure out what it is they need and help them help themselves build it. Um, and there's this problem of like literally knowing how to find those people um, is is really challenging. Like I don't necessarily know where to look and to um, try to come with like prescriptive solutions or like you know, go out with my binoculars looking for the person in the third world country that I'm supposed to design for. Um, it's really difficult to um, to kind of know where to start with that sometimes. So 
I did want to ask like panelists and and our new friend, um, kind of how do you think about like we tend to when we do you know user research or um, try to like measure the impact of the things that we make, um, we rely on kind of simplified like easy things like analytics um, and like metrics that they're satisfying because you can count a number and think it's the right number and check a box, but they're actually limiting and kind of useless and opaque and don't really particularly connect to reality. Um, and they end up also like leading you to design for the people that are already there. Um, and certainly not like leading you into new, new areas or like inviting new people in. So wondering how you think about like how to measure success or how to like get richer, better feedback um, and have that be a more interactive process and just sort of open the borders of it so that more people are able to participate um, and more people are able to kind of create. Hey guys, I'm Raghav. I'm building a community-led fundraising platform. I'll be not quadratic. Um, but just to, like, on, on what you said, I often think, and it's something I was thinking earlier, like for quadratic funding, right? Mathematically speaking, it's not the most straightforward thing. But, you know, like, let's say in the third world today, like in India, I'm from India, a lot of people don't have bank accounts, right? The goal is not to teach them how a bank works. The goal is perhaps first, let's get them bank account. Let's tell them, okay, this is why it's good for you. You don't need to know the economics of it yet. So I think a similar thing can happen here where like our first goal is as long as we can get the service that we need, let's get that to them. And over time, as that leads to whatever prosperity we hope for, then we can reach a point where we can have education around those things. If we just keep waiting for education and just for that, we don't provide them what we can provide them today, I think that would be a misstep. Also just to, uh, yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that's like my biggest, um, you know, I think learning from the last few years is um, that like you need politics to be like, um, what's the word? So like prefigurative, like they need to like basically like you need to like take action towards the thing that you want to see in the world in some way. And I think crypto does that by definition. Like we just build things. We like, they sometimes don't work, you know, at all. Um, sometimes they work kind of okay, but they're kind of janky. And then ho hopefully sometimes they work really well and like are sustainable for like the long term. I think the biggest challenge I see, uh, aside from dropping my phone apparently, is that we really don't have a, you know, we we're talking here about like participants, but we don't have a really good way to do that globally, as Zolthir mentioned. And I think that's still a missing point here. We're still doing better than like, you know, Meta or something like that, where like you're literally just in a room and like Silicon Valley like designing for a community that's global, like as if that's going to just magically work for everyone. Um, I think there's more like local first principles and thinking here. Um, but we still don't have that really broad global participation. I think it's one of the reasons that like, you know, we sort of like as a community need to be having more conferences in places like Bogota to like participate more with local communities. Um, we probably are not doing that enough, but I'm hopeful that we're like getting, you know, in the right direction there. Quick response to that. Because <laughs> honestly, I, I do think there's a lot that we can learn from traditional companies um, in this uh, yeah, area of how do you design for local communities. Um, even being at a conference, I'm not sure how many people actually go outside of the venue to explore. Um, personally, a big proponent of field, field research. Uh, trip to Venezuela was most insightful in my last five years uh, in crypto. Um, yeah, just to kind of make the point, I think there's a lot that we can learn from traditional companies in how do we um, how do we study and work with local communities. There is a reason that some of these companies are so successful to the extent that we believe it's detrimental, um, because there are some things that they've managed to do really well. And understanding uh, needs on the ground in local communities is is definitely one of those um, things dream job. Um, maybe to riff on that a little bit, one of the um, challenges I found in trying to get more on the ground uh, experiences and insights and connecting to communities to work and design alongside um, has been that um, it requires a certain degree of openness in what we're building. 
um, because you go on, you, like you land, you put your feet on the ground and you're like, oh my God, this is never going to work. But you've already spent six months to do, like developing for something that's then not going to work. Um, and so that, that open mindset um, plus the funding <laughs> um, to that like uncertainty of what the outcome will be um, is, I think, something that as a community we can all uh, contribute to. Um, how? Not sure. Maybe there's someone here who has a better answer. So, um, the question that I actually came to ask. So we speak about obviously ownership and self-sovereignty and stuff, and that obviously comes at a cost of like, fine. there's a lot more finality of action in the blockchain, right? Once you sign something, you sign it. So do you think the future of these apps, or anything that we build in this new internet, is more about communicating to people that your mistakes are your mistakes and that's okay? Or is it more about making sure systems are sort of, they have the scope for mistakes, which can write, be from simple steps like, and are you sure pop-up box all the way to maybe some kind of like magical reversible transactions on chain, I don't know. Does anyone have a response to that? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's a great question, right? And it's sort of the opposite of, um, or it could be the opposite of the thing that I said at the very beginning about sort of putting like, bumpers on everything so that you just can't screw up even if you wanted to. Um, and there is this really interesting dynamic between trying to give people choices and then not sort of putting people in danger by um, just like throwing them into a snake pit without even telling them what a snake is first. Like that you have to give people the tools to not make those horrific mistakes, um, but also um, not do that in a way that limits them from making like all of the choices that you would want them to have. Um, I know you. Hello. I didn't know when the session was ending, so I was going to chill at the end. But I just wanted, um, <laughs> just wanted to I thank you guys for the conversation. But I think in, in that regard, as far as like, how do we create ecosystems where people are more... Uh, able to make mistakes, et cetera. I think a lot of it has to do with progressive disclosure, of people getting used to some of this technology as they get aware of what's really happening on the front end, on the back end, and on the actual protocol level. Uh, so just kind of walking them through that focus of like, okay, this is, this is some sort of handholded guided functionalities of how you actually get into this ecosystem. I think there's a lot of education, communication around language, all those things that you guys have already kind of highlighted that will lead us to that. Um, but it is a long journey. Like People need to come and play with this, some of this stuff. And we don't have the opportunity or test nets or all these resources where people can experiment with some, some of this stuff and not have that risk factor associated with it. So I think gaming and all these other mechanisms of like pull apps, et cetera, provide you that opportunity to interface with this technology and then learn a little bit more. Uh, but we need more use cases. We need more creative thinking around some of this functionality for people to actually start using it. Thank you for that. Um, we do kind of have to wrap up now, but um, yeah, I want to thank all of you and also everybody who was brave enough to come up here and join us. Um, you guys brought a lot of really good points and good questions. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. And I wanted to end on another Zach Mandeville quote, if I could just, there we go. Um, <laughs> so, and I think Akil, you actually wrapped this up rather nicely for me to build Whatever you're building for everyone, uh, we must expect and empower the best from anyone. Um, so thank you, everybody. Let's go out and do, do that. Thank you.